Okay. Let's. No problem.
exciting things going on at the Humanity Center uh, this year. Um, as I said, play is the general theme for this year, and so we have a lot of events coming up related to that. And I just wanted to mention we have a film showing uh, on October 24th coming up here on campus, uh, and that's a, a showing of the film The Prestige at 6 o'clock here on campus in the Human Sciences Building, 169. So please come out for that. And if you pick up the newsletter, you'll see there's other events later in the fall as well coming up. Um, so please come out and support the Humanity Center. Also, you'll notice there's a little flyer outside that has our social media information. We are live on Twitter as of today, so make sure to add us to your Twitter stream and, you know, while you're parsing political news and puppy videos, you'll see great information from the Humanity Center. Um, so I, I think I've got to announce myself. We are the new interim co-directors. I'm uh, Dr. Michael Borshek from English. But my colleague from English, Dr. Allison Whitman, who's going to introduce uh, tonight's speaker. Um, well, we are delighted to have tonight's speaker, uh, Dr. Eric Zimmerman. He is a faculty member at New York University, uh, where he was a, a founding member of the Game Center in the Tisch School of the Arts. Uh, he's also co-founder of Game Lab, a game design company in New York, uh, especially well known for Diner Bash. Um, but his design work ranges from card games, board games, um, online games, all the way up to uh, collaborations with architects, doing installation work in museums, as a, a play component. Um, his work has been featured at the Museum of Modern Art, at the Smithsonian in Washington, and at festivals all over the world. <coughs> and we are delighted to have him here to um, talk about living in the Lumen. Thank you, Allison and Mike. Um, first of all, I'm not a doctor, just so you know. I feel like it. No, no, that's okay. I appreciate the promotion uh, or the, the honorary degree. But uh, I'm not a doctor, but I feel like it's sort of uh, like when the, uh, you know, the, the, the war movie where the sergeant says, don't call me officer, I'm not a, you know. I'm sort of, I don't belong, I can't get into the officer's club, but I'll, I'll do my best tonight. Um, so thanks everybody for coming. It's, it's been uh, lovely to visit Lubbock. I'm from Bloomington, Indiana originally, so Lubbock is a, actually, the campus is a similar size. The town is a little bit bigger, but it's been really nice and nostalgic to visit a, uh, a college town and, um, and see a little bit of the local culture. So thanks to the university for having me out and for hosting me. And um, I'm really happy to talk to you tonight about, about a few different things. And I believe that, um, I believe also that uh, uh, there's a reception afterwards as well. So, okay. Um, so I spent a lot of time in the games world, uh, even though I'm a game designer. And uh, tonight I am gonna talk about uh, game design because it's what I know, but it's always nice to talk to people that kind of branch out into different areas as well. Um, tonight, tonight I want to talk about the relevance of games uh, to design and literacy and culture at large. Um, and this is also a little bit of an artist's talk or a designer's talk. Um, so I'm going to share uh, some examples of my work, some of the, work, some of the kinds of work that, that, that Allison um, was mentioning as well. Um, but let me talk a little bit about um, uh, my own practice as a game designer so you can kind of see where I'm coming from. I ran a studio. I've worked in the game industry for about 25 years. Um, and I've only been a full-time academic for the last eight years or so. Uh, I ran a company in New York City called Game Lab, uh, an indie studio that started in 2000 that um, um, did mostly online games that I ran for 10 years with Peter Lee. Um, Sissy Fight uh, was a game about, uh, that I did uh, prior to Game Lab about little girls on the internet, sort of a feminist intervention into the, the culture of games and the, uh, as well. Um, and I do tabletop games, as um, Allison mentioned. Um, these are a couple of my recent titles. I collaborate with um, architect Natalie Pozzi in the last several years on doing large-scale museum installations that are interactive and about, about play. Um, and I also co-founded the Institute of Play, which is an organization that looks at the intersection of games and learning. So although most of my work as a game designer is in the sort of commercial entertainment or experimental art arena, I've also done some work 
uh, that looks at the intersection of games and learning. Uh, there's a scholarly component to what I do, so I've written some books on game design. I co-authored with Katie Salen, Rules of Play, that's a standard textbook in game design. Um, and now I teach at the NYU Game Center. Um, so that's in Tisch School of the Arts at NYU. And so we have a BFA program and an MFA program, and our orientation is really thinking about games as a form of culture, um, alongside other forms of culture like film, media, uh, sorry, film, theater, um, dance, music, and things like that. Now, I probably don't need to say this to this crowd, but just sometimes when you talk about games to people that are coming from outside games, they have a particular picture in their head of the kind of work that NYU does, and most of our students are on the kind of indie game side of things. So they're less interested in working in the mainstream commercial industry, and more of them end up uh, starting their own companies or working for small studios. Much like indie film, these are lower budget, more experimental projects. These are some of our projects from our graduating students um, uh, over the last few years. Can everybody see the image? Looks a little, from my uh, angle, it's a little washed out. It's OK? Yeah. You, it, yes, it's washed out, but yes, you can also see it. So I don't, I, maybe we should. Uh, I don't know. Are the AV people in this in this secret room? Is this the, the man behind the curtain? Hey, I think. <laughs> Voila. So maybe just turn them down a little bit so we can see the images more. Is that better? Okay. But now I don't get my moment in the spotlight. Uh, you can still see me. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay. So. In terms, my, uh, my background is actually uh, in the art uh, realm. I was trained as an artist. Um, and uh, when I was a student, I couldn't really study games. There weren't degree programs or departments around games. And I ended up with a BFA and an MFA. And I had a funny kind of education because uh, on the one hand, I got a very modernist training uh, in art as purely visual phenomena. So a lot of my painting professors were students of Joseph Albers trained in this modernist academic idea that there, one of my professors would said things like, there are no ideas in art. Art was line, color, and composition. But what was happening at the same time was, this was in the late 80s, early 90s. So this is when uh, it was in Philadelphia, but close enough to the New York City art world. And this is a photograph from Robert Maplethorpe. And this was the, while I was in school, the whole uh, controversy was raging around whether or not the NEA should fund controversial artwork like his, a so-called controversial artwork. And the idea of art as a cultural critique was kind of what was happening in the art world. So I was kind of torn between these two perspectives. Um, and when I left school and started working at a game company, I was expecting that there would be a discipline of game design, the way there had been sort of schools of thought around art, uh, you know, this approach or that approach. But it really didn't exist, despite the fact that games were already, by this time in the early 90s, a certainly an economic force, if not a cultural force as well. Um, but my research started in beginning to teach game design with Frank Lance, uh, who's now the director of the NYU Game Center and co-authoring Rules of Play with Katie Salen, and just to think about what it meant to have game design as a discipline. Uh, on the game half, for me, that means thinking about games on and off the computer. Um, I take the very long view that games are an ancient form of human expression. There are games that are about 10,000 years old. Um, and that game design, we'll talk a little bit more about what that means tonight, but it's not programming and not visual design. Uh, it's not project management or writing or the, the leadership of the project. Um, so what do game designers do? Well, one way of thinking about it is that game designers are sort of like experienced designers, and by creating rules and other structures, they create an experience for a player. Um, and when I'm thinking about what is game design, I want to ask, what are games? How do they function? How do they create meaningful experiences for players? And how do they sit within culture at large? Um, the design half is looking outwards, not just at games themselves, but how they relate to other design disciplines, like architecture or graphic design. How do we produce these experiences in a human context, in a social and cultural context? And, and how do games fit within this larger landscape of media, art, and entertainment? Um, but before we get to all of those big questions, uh, let's play a game. Uh, so we're going to play a game together. Don't worry, it's not going to require that much uh, 
a commitment from you. In fact, you can even stay in your seats. But I, so when we start, you're going to sort of turn in your chairs and form into groups of something like four, five, six, seven, eight people. So you'll sort of clump with people around you. But here's how, here's how it's going to work. Once we get started, um, you're going to hold out a hand uh, of five fingers. It's called five fingers. And this, these fingers, they are your life. You want to hold on to them. Because when you lose all of your fingers, you're out of the game completely. And the last person with any fingers remaining wins. So what do you do on your turn? Anybody can start. It doesn't matter. Pick someone and then go around the circle. And when it's your turn, with your other hand, you point at someone and they lose a finger. And that's the whole game. So it's very, very simple. Uh, so, when, so you're just going to pick someone to, to, to I'm going to put the rules up here. Although it's so simple, you probably don't need these, but just in case, as reference. Um, so turn around, form in your groups, play with someone you don't know. Uh, and uh, it's OK if you're over, over a chair or something. Turn around. Yeah, every, everyone, you don't have to play, of course. But I encourage you to try. Even three people is OK. So uh, you two could join the, the group of three back there if you want. Two, two people doesn't really work as well. Anyone starts. All right, we've, get, we've just got our big groups left, so let's accelerate. Don't be too careful. It's get, getting down to the wire. Uh, oh, or oh, this group's still alive, too. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, keep going. All right, hey, big big group in the back. Just speed it up a little bit. We're all we're all waiting for you. Okay. Well, you know, it's these are important these are important decisions. I understand, but. I have no idea what that means, but uh, <laughs> double jeopardy. <Okay. laughs> okay. Group, big group, please. I hear numbers coming from the back there. We need to uh, play quickly. We're all watching you, though. It's not bad. It's not bad spectator sport. OK, we need a judge's ruling on this turn, I think. (laughs) (laughs) 
All right, I think we have a winner. <laughs> Um, okay. All right, settle down, uh, boys and girls. Um, so what, there's many ways of framing games. There's, we can think of them as narrative systems. We can think of them as gender representation. But one way that we can think about them is as, as a form of meaning. And that what happens when you design a game and a game gets played is that meaning is created. So this, this gesture of pointing at someone could mean many things. It could mean, I want that flavor of ice cream. It could mean we're number one, go uh, ra ra Rangers? No, it's uh, Raiders. Raiders. Oh my gosh. There's going to be someone waiting to, to, to get me out of the door. Sorry. Faux pas. Raiders, I tried. I'm not local. I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, the, but, but in the context of Five Fingers, this, this gesture means starts to mean something else, right? It means, I, I mean, I, I saw all of you um, listen to the rules and get it. OK, we're going to do something interactive. And then you understood it. It seems really simple. But then almost immediately, as you started playing, there were these kind of waves and ripples of laughter coming, coming out from each group. Um, and there's a lot of things that happened. Um, I heard a lot of numerical calculation from the group in the back. Uh, I, saw, I heard some people begging for their lives. Uh, uh, there, there was a lot of ways of, uh, uh, there, were, there was the very very polite and discreet pointing, which looked like this. The big group in the back did a lot of this kind of like, sort of tossing, tossing a point. And I saw some very aggressive uh, yeah, one as well. Um, so so what, what's interesting, there's a lot of things that are interesting to me. But we're going to return to this example. But games are a context where we can create these kinds of social meanings and, and emotional meanings um, and other kinds of meanings with each other. And the argument I want to make tonight about this ludic century idea is that games can be an important part of how we think about meaning in design and in literacy and in culture. I want to argue that there's a special relationship between games and the times that we're living in, um, which you, know, you can sort of tell from the somewhat overblown title of this talk, Living in the Ludic Century. So what, what do I mean by this? The ludic century is the idea that we're living in a time that can be uh, potentially defined by games. Um, and um, the, the turn of the 20th century saw the rise of an industrial age, followed by an, an information uh, revolution in the second half of the 20th century that information became abstracted into ones and zeros of digital technology. And so one question is, well, what's next? What's happened since? the kind of rise of digital technology and information. And I want to argue that one way of parsing our present, our present time is that we're living in a ludic age, a ludic coming from the Latin word for play, a time that could usefully be characterized by way of play and games. And I realize this is a sort of a, 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 a vast and gross simplification of history, um, uh, and that also that this is not the only way of thinking about the times that, that we're living in. Um, so, in this idea of the ludic century, one of the ideas is that the moving image has been put at play. And while the 20th century could be thought of in terms of a lot of different kinds of culture, there was a lot of wonderful things that happened in innovation in theater and, and poetry and, uh, uh, and music. Um, film and video, in a sense, dominated or came to dominate uh, advertising, news and journalism, personal storytelling, epic cultural narratives, government propaganda really were, were most powerfully put forward by, by the moving image. Um, and the moving image, in many ways, is an informational form of culture. It's a time-based medium. It's a stream of information that's being displayed and, and read by a, a viewer. But in a sense, in a traditional sense, it was passive. The cinema uh, was viewed in a dark theater or, or huddled a group huddled around a television. And while there is interaction, cognitive and social interaction around these images, um, in our time, the moving image has been put even more at play as it's become more modular and modifiable and participatory. Um, and if we think about how the moving image is, is now compared to these darkened cinema theaters that it's streamed and stopped and started, it's on a window on a desktop, or it's surrounded and passed along by social media, it's not just a linear theater that wants to immerse you and command all of your attention. Um, so if the 20th century was dominated by the moving image, I want to say that one way of thinking about the 21st century is that games or things like games 
um, as a form of media art, or entertainment, or culture that's particularly modular and customizable and systemic, although, again, games are ancient, um, that they are uh, more and more relevant to understanding how the world works. Um, and I want to talk about three concepts tonight relative to the ludic century, um, systems and play and design. And considered together, they're not just three ways of understanding games uh, or really design, but they're also really related to ideas about literacy. Um, now, I'm not a literacy scholar, but according to my friends that, that work in literacy, literacy is just the, the, the ability to create and, and understand meaning. Um, and so, um, the, let's see, do I have a Sharpie in my bag? So if I, if I just write on a piece of paper like this, um, hello, in a sense, this is an act of literacy, right? It's connected to meaning. Um, that the creation and understanding of meaning is what, is what literacy is about. Um, and so, um, there, of course, that's been supplanted in recent decades by all other kinds of literacy, visual literacy, technological literacy, um, that it's evolved. Um, but the, what I want to say about literacy in the context of the ludic century is that there are new forms of what it means to be literate uh, in, in the world today and in culture and society today. Um, let's start with systems. So, um, systems is really, on the simplest level, a set of parts that uh, interact with each other to form a whole. Um, that can be the players in, of a game and their relationships to each other. Um, if we think about five fingers, um, the finger gets this meaning, which is, um, I, I heard some great things. I think I heard some things like, I'm sorry, someone's got to die, right before, the, I'm sorry, right before the finger got pointed. And then, so that's, that's really a different meaning being given to this finger. It's sort of a life and death matter within our little toy universe that we made in the game. Um, and so um, the meaning of the finger only exists because of its relationships to the other people and within the larger system of the game. And that's what the game does. The game is there to give this gesture meaning. And, and maybe to do other things as well. Um, just like the parts of a language just gain their meaning by virtue of this set of relationships between them. Um, and so the meaning through gameplay uh, emerges out of this set of relationships uh, in a system. Um, and systems are very much part of this idea of the ludic century. Um, today, I would argue that the ways that we, that we learn, the ways that we, we socialize, the ways that we uh, romance, uh, the ways that we conduct our finances and connect with our governments, the way that we research and communicate, all of these fairly essential aspects of our lives are very much intertwined with um, networks of complex information. Um, and so there's a sense in which a lot of our lives are increasingly becoming more and more embedded in these systems. And again, that's why this kind of literacy, this, this way of thinking, and games are not the only way of of parsing this present moment, but for me, they're a useful way of thinking about the ludic century. Um, games are very much the cultural form of systems. I mean, a building is a system, a, a room is a system. There's here a set of parts that are interacting to form a whole in a number of ways. A song is a system, an advertisement is a system. But games, for me, are particularly a uh, relevant, very ancient form of human expression, where the, the, the form itself is about pushing and pulling at the limits of the system and seeing what happens. So every game that we play, in a sense, is a laboratory for understanding what systems are and how they work. And again, I know, I know I'm a game designer, so this whole ludic century idea is extremely myopic. It just, it's not a coincidence that my, my home discipline is the way that I'm looking at the whole world. So again, I'm not trying to impose game design on everybody's point of view, but really I'm offering my point of view and maybe there's something useful for you in, in the work that you're doing. Um, so what does it have to do with literacy? I, I, uh, I want to argue that we need these new literacies related to the ludic century to make sense of our world. Um, without an understanding of the parts and the whole, we're just not literate, uh, we're just not literate people. Um, and just as digital technology has given games a new relevance in our time, they've given this kinds of systems thinking and systems literacy relevance too. Let's take an example from our political moment, uh, gerrymandering. This is the idea that in the United States, um, usually with uh, uh, districts for the uh, House of Representatives, 
um, and also sometimes on more local and state districts as well, that they can be redrawn by the party in power. And that today, again, because of digital technology, there's software that can predict voter preferences and, and turn out really on a block by block radius. And so by dragging lines and slightly adjusting the borders of these, of these, um, of these districts, they can be strategically redrawn. And this has definitely been a big issue in Texas, I know, uh, over the last at least 10, 10 years or more, um, that, the, that the party in power then can redraw and re-entrench these districts. Now, we see this in games as well. This, we could think of this as a positive feedback loop, like in a real-time strategy game, where if you get an early lead and you're able to get a little bit of an edge on your opponent, then that allows you to get even more power, which allows you to get more of a lead and more of an edge. Um, but what happens in games, it's often balanced because that buildup of your forces in a real-time strategy game is only one of a few strategies that you can take. Um, in the case of uh, StarCraft II, a rush strategy, a defense strategy, or an economic win. So there's other factors that balance this one overwhelming factor from going out of control. And we'll, let's take one more example. Um, in the classic eight ball game of, two, of pool, there's also a positive feedback or a snowball. Can any, does anyone, can anyone think of what it is, the eight ball version of pool? A situation where if you get ahead, you can get even more ahead. Can anyone think about what it is? This is the game where, where two people play, as soon as you hit in, stripes or solids, that's your, that's your yes? Uh, letting your opponent knock all of his balls out, so that way all of your balls are clear, so you can get clear shots for your balls? Um, no, but that's fascinating. <laughs> so you're saying that when your opponent's balls are off the table, you can get a more clear shot. Um, that is, well, we're going to return to that in just a second. But yes, let's hear. Uh, your advantage in pool would be if you break, and you break, and let's say you score in uh, a solid, you take the solid and let your opponent then run strikes. So you're ahead by one. Right. Yeah, yeah, not only are you ahead by one, but every time you sink another solid, you get to take another turn, right? So, so that's true, even from the, the break, I hadn't thought about that, but even from the very break, you can get ahead, and then again ahead, and ahead, and ahead. So if you're ahead, it's rewarding you for being ahead. But what you mentioned is the, counter, the counterbalance to that. And usually, now what you said is a fascinating theory, and I have to think about that's it, but, <laughs> what's that? That's how I win with my friends. But typically, <laughs> but typically in, in, in pool, I've heard that it's assumed that when you have more balls on the table, you have more shots, right? So it's easier. So that's a catch-up mechanic. It's the opposite of a snowballing mechanic. So I agree with you. That's an important part of pool. But it pulls against the, the rewarding of getting ahead. Because as you get ahead, you also you have less and less good shots, um, which I think is what you were saying. So, that's, so, so these, again, in a designed context, like a game, we can sort of counterbalance this. But in a, a, in, in a, in a system like like the government, um, there's not necessarily designed things that help a game be balanced over time. And so the result is what often feels like unfairness, where um, the representatives don't actually represent um, their, the, the people in an, in an equitable way, and that there's the potential for real voter disenfranchisement, often along the lines of race and class and ideology, where people aren't being fully represented. Um, but it's also part of how the system is structured, because the American system is winner take all. It doesn't matter if you are in a 90-10, 90%-10% minority, or a 60-40 minority. That's just the way the system was designed. Whoever gets the most in the district, um, it was not designed to be exactly proportional representation. And this is a classic Euro game mechanic, board game mechanic. This is El Grande, where the regional winner takes all, so I'm very sorry, uh, green and yellow, but Granada is going to red. Uh, and those pieces that you put there were, were wasted. Um, so can we blame people for gerrymandering? And aren't they really just playing the game well, the way that it was designed? In, in this case, there are systems within systems within systems. And the question is, is the system doing what it was designed to do in the, in the sense of democracy? Um, I think that games are part of the problem in the sense of, of, of gaming a system and, uh, and the ways that um, uh, this sort of exploitative thinking is, is happening. But they maybe can be part of the solution as well. Um, so again, these are the elements of the ludic century idea. We've been talking about systems. And let's talk a little bit for a moment about play. Um, so to understand play, I want to start with uh, talking about the rules of the game. Games have rules. It's one of the, the funny things about games as a cultural form. Um, 
what, what, does it, can anyone help me? Uh, what are the rules of tic-tac-toe? What is a rule of tic-tac-toe? Anybody? What is one rule of tic-tac-toe? Three in a row you win. Three in a row you win. That's very important, winning condition. What else? Take turns. Take turns. Take turns, yes. Here, did you have, did you, who takes turns? The X's and the O's. Just X's and O's two take players. turns. Two players, two right? Players. Are we, yeah, I like, I like uh, the uh, personification of the X's and O's. Two players, so two players take turns. What do they do on a turn? Put one, put one X or an O in one of nine squares. In, in, oh, right, nine squares, that's important. So you can mark an X or an O in any square, is that right? <laughs> well, as long as it's not taken. Yes, very good, yeah, empty square. So I think we have it. Three by three grid, two players t alternate turns, placing an X or an O in an empty square. Um, three in a row wins. Is there anything else? Any other end state? Still stalemate. Yes. If you can't play, then, then it ends in a time. So, let's, so these are the rules. Thank you for helping me. Obviously, I had them here on the next slide, but it was <laughs> nice talking with you about them. Uh, so uh, every game of tic-tac-toe that's ever been played has followed these, has followed these rules. Um, and I'm not saying that tic-tac-toe is a perfect game. Uh, once you're sort of beyond uh, uh, being a, a little kid, it's, it's no longer that challenging. But this is the interesting power of games to me, that these simple rules have generated millions or probably billions of hours of, of human behavior. Um, and when people sit down to play tic-tac-toe with each other, whether they're playing on a whiteboard or they're carving it on their kitchen table with a knife, I guess they just got in trouble, or whatever, sharp, sharp, maybe sharp, Sharpie on a bedroom wall. Uh, the, they're, they're, in a sense, speaking the language of tic-tac-toe to each other. It's a context where, they're, where, where it's giving these marks meaning because of the relationship among them. Now, rules in a game are kind of interesting and strange as a cultural form. Um, certainly, all we can think of, we can think of the, the kind of formal characteristics of other forms of media, but math are particularly, sorry, games are particularly kind of mathy if you look under the hood, right? Um, rules are, rules have these characteristics that they're all logical, they're in, in a classical sense of what a game is. They're unambiguous. If you're, if you're, um, if you're playing baseball and you say, well, this tree is second base, and then someone says, well, I'm, you know, does that mean I can actually touch this little branch here and be really close to the third base and they're tagged out? But no, was it the trunk of the tree or is it the root of the tree? And then there's an argument. Well, you have to resolve that argument before you can continue playing. So there's a sense in which the, the rules of games are fixed and rigid. They're logical and rational. And when you think about games like that, it doesn't sound, they don't actually sound that much fun. But what happens when you, um, uh, when you enter into a game and you, um, and, you, uh, and you limit your behavior by the restrictions of the rules the way you did with, with five fingers, what you get is play. And play, play is the opposite of rules. So while rules are fixed and rigid, play is improvisational and spontaneous and creative. And to me, that's one of the things that continually fascinates me about, about games as, as a game designer. Um, what's interesting about play and its relationship to systems is that, um, you know, in English, we have this idea of play uh, we use it in a few different ways. We can talk about like the play of gears, the little bit of wiggle room, right, between between gears. But we can also think about it like the like a steering wheel, right? We talk about the play of a steering wheel. Um, that's the amount that you can wiggle the steering wheel before it really starts to to um, uh, turn the wheels of the car. So what is that play in this example? What is that play of the steering wheel? Well, we have um, there's a system here, right? There's a steering wheel. But it's connected to, to a drive shaft and to an axle and to, to two tires so that when we turn the steering wheel, these tires rotate, right? So we have this utilitarian system that's just meant to drive a car. But the play in the system, what we call the play, that's kind of like the interstitial movement when the system isn't just functioning in a purely logical way. So that we can, the, we can think about play as something which is not just the purely logical functioning of the system. What's interesting to me is that this play is, is there in the system only because there's a system there. If we didn't have this logical system, this utilitarian system, there wouldn't be a thing in which we're playing or we can have play. Um, but play is there because of the system, but it's also there kind of in spite of the system or despite the system. It's the thing that resists the system in a sense. 
Um, it's a very weak resistance here. But if we think about play, I feel like I have to push my car off stage. It's feeling crowded. <laughs> this, also, this is also a class in mind. No, just kidding. Um, but if we think about um, uh, play as like slang and language, right? The way that, that, that new words can enter uh, language. And, and at first, they are, um, at first they're the things that are kind of interstitial and and we don't know what they are, but eventually they become part of the mainstream language and really change and transform it. So play doesn't just have to be wiggle room, it can also be that thing which, through its play, transforms the system into something new. Of course, by the time the slang becomes normal words, there's new slang appearing at the margins of the system. Um, so uh, if we think about um, five fingers, there was plenty of unexpected play. I mean, there were these fixed rules, but, um, which if I just showed them to you without the sort of the entertaining, you know, five, five fingers of your life, it would kind of look sort of boring, just this text on a screen. But your experience of the game was something very innovative and fun. I, and I love doing this exercise because I really see uh, new things uh, every time that I play. I don't think that I had seen someone counting out loud all of the people's fingers left. And what I really liked about, about the way you were playing was not just that you were counting everyone's fingers, but you did it so publicly. It was, it wasn't just in your head. It was like you, somehow by, by, by sharing all this information, you were sort of absolving yourself of all the calculation that you were doing. So you were doing it in, in partnership with everybody. Um, so so, so that, that to me is very interesting. Sissy Fight, the game that I mentioned before about little girls uh, on a playground, um, had a lot of play and player innovation. Some of it was within the game, and some of it was within the fan community. Um, that there was a Sissy Fight Museum of Modern Art when this game was popular, where people created fan art, in this case, Keith Haring and a Dutch distill abstraction. I'm sorry, the slides are slightly cut off on the sides. But, um, uh, 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 and um, uh, here we see a, uh, a Picasso, a Monet, and a Chagall. And I should mention that lollipops are important because lollipops, these little hearts, uh, are your self-esteem. So the goal is to reduce the self-esteem of the other players. It's a very dark, darkly humorous game. It's, a game, it's not a game for children, but it's a game about childhood. Um, and so uh, lollipops are one of the ways that you can, um, you can get, your, get your self esteem back. Uh, you have a limited supply of lollipops. Um, and so in, uh, in, this, uh, in this, you can actually see there's, there, the lollipops have been added. The, the, the water lilies have been turned into lollipops uh, in, in different ways in the game. So um, the, the, in the ludic century, um, if we think about systems and play, systems are just not enough. The idea of analytically understanding how systems function is not sufficient to really appreciating uh, the kind of the human element. Because systems, once people enter into them, they become fuzzy. The information is, is put at play. In the 20th century, we had things like the Library of Congress and encyclopedias as the way that people research, this sort of fixed expert systems. Um, but the the the, uh, where, where you sort of, you, you go to them to, to get your information. In the ludic century, the main model for research, just in terms of use, is the internet or, or Wikipedia, right? That, that Wikipedia, it's a messy system. It's a system where there's a blurry line between the, the creators of information and the users of information. And in fact, the, the, the abuse of, of the system itself is part of the self-policing that the system does. It's, it's, it's a very um, messy system, but this is, um, this is, part of the, uh, this is part of the kind of reality of the ludic century that we're living in now. Um, the image that I'm showing is uh, from artist and writer James uh, Bridal. He made this object. It's a book with every edit made to a single Wikipedia article, The Iraq War, over a period of five years from December 2004 to November 2009. Um, so it's uh, just a sort of testament, an interesting art project, a testament to the way that the information is not static in the same way. Today we play with our media. It streams, it's manipulated, downloaded, discussed, and dissected on social media, reviewed and mashed up and appropriated online. Another angle on play comes from Bernie DeCoven. And if you're interested in games, I highly recommend this book, The Well-Played Game. Bernie DeCoven was an amazing uh, designer and advocate for play who passed away within the last year. Um, but he had an idea of play as a community, um, that players become part of a shared human system. And that he also was interested in blurring the lines between designers and players, um, undermining the idea of the fixed authority of the designer. Uh, and that as we play, we create these communities and we shape the play according to the ways that, that we want to play it. 
Um, uh, to talk a little bit about, connected to my work, I want to talk about one project, one of my recent projects with Natalie Pozzi, the architect um, that Allison mentioned, and the project is called Waiting Rooms. It's not technically a game, but it has a lot of game elements. Um, Natalie and I have been doing installations for several years. This was, I think, our sixth installation. In the past, they had been these kind of big architectural um, uh, objects, and we always had this problem of explaining the rules to people. But I, I, I have to promise you, the last thing a person going to a museum wants to do is read the rules of a game, understand the rules, sit down and, OK, how do you play? Nobody wants to do that. So we really wanted to solve that in this, in this installation. And the rules are extremely simple. Um, the rules might be uh, uh, take a ticket and have a seat and wait for your number to be called. So you, there's no explanation in a sense. It's just like a waiting room. This is an installation that takes over a whole building. Uh, we did it first at the Rubin Museum in New York City and more recently in Boston at the Boston Museum of Science. And there's about 15 or 16 rooms. Um, so it's sort of a building-sized installation. And I should say that a lot of the spaces are not the main public spaces, but we use things like the staff lounge, utility corridors, the freight elevator, the storage rooms. So you actually end up traveling to parts of the building that you wouldn't normally. And it's a little bit like an immersive theater project or a little bit like, it's actually nothing like an escape room, but it sort of bears some <laughs> resemblance to, to those things. I'm always trying to say it's not an escape room. Um, I should also say that it was inspired um, a lot by Natalie's experience of the US immigration system and passing through the border. She's, she's not from the United States. So um, uh, it was also inspired by a lot of her, her very Kafka-esque experiences with the, with the US immigration system. Um, there's two, there, all of the rooms are, are, are connected by lines. And there's two economies. There's tickets and pennies. So you might enter the, the experience being very rich uh, because you happen to have a lot of pennies in your pocket. Um, or you might have none. But every room gives you ways to, to earn and spend um, these pennies and tickets. Um, it's very, it looks very temporary. So we specifically have all the signage, all the props look like they were just put there. Um, and um, so, so there's no like sort of architectural, physical elements. Everything looks very temporary. Um, the, the, in a, a room always has uh, lines uh, heading off of it, these blue tape lines. And so it's sort of like being at an airport or a hospital. You might follow a line. You don't know where they go. But you have to pay an exit fee to the attendant in the room. So every room has, has one or two or three attendants um, there. Um, and you never really know where you're going. So try, starting to explore this strange labyrinth-like connected rooms is, is also part of the experience. Um, the attendants that are in the rooms help you follow the rules. Um, and the experience is really like a dystopian bureaucracy. You're not told why you're there. You're not told if there's a goal or, or, or what a goal might be. You're not really given a purpose. Um, it's, it's a non-narrative project. So the, these, the, the people that are, that are the attendants are not actors. We give them a job description. In fact, they're usually related to the institutions. This was the, the, the director of programming at the Rubin Museum, uh, who looks like an amazing Wes Anderson character uh, in, this, in this context. Um, but, but the plot is really determined by the narrative of the people. Um, this is a diagram um, of the Rubin Museum installation of the, the spaces and rules. And actually, in one of the rooms, you could buy a map, uh, which became very valuable. Um, and um, uh, the, the, I want to give you a, a, sense of, um, a sense of this is a, a close up on some of the rooms. You can see how they're, they're connected by lines, and uh, they go up different stairs, and um, uh, what, what you pay in different rooms. The sitting room here. Uh, what, what I want to talk to you a little bit about now is the systems and play idea. That this, this is a, an art project or an experience that was about exploring this relationship um, uh, between systems and play on many levels. Um, so the basic idea of the sitting room is you, you walk in, and every room has a sort of a slightly different, every room's like a little social experiment, where there's some rules that have been set up that put you in a particular relationship with the other people. There's an attendant in the sitting room who, who looks at her watch every minute and says, it's 8.32. Um, and when people enter, she says, Would you, you may have a seat if you like. Now, if someone is sitting in one of these five chairs, when she says it's 8.32, she'll take a penny and give it to whoever's sitting in a chair. And this, a lot of players realized, oh my gosh, I can earn pennies here. Because you're spending all this money to try and get out of these rooms. And they're, you, if you run out of, if you can't pay a fee out or argue or negotiate with other players or trade with them, a guard will come and collect you. And nobody wanted that to happen, although really they just take you back to the start. Um, but 
but the, 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 at the sitting room, people realized, oh, I can sit here and I'm guaranteed to earn a penny a minute. So that's what they did. And people, people sat there. Um, many people were there for like 20 or 30 minutes earning a lot of pennies for themselves um, at 60 cents uh, an hour. Uh, and, uh, but that was a valuable use of their time in this context. Um, so what started happening is people came up with different ways of how do we make a line, a physical line. What, in Boston, there was a whiteboard. People were trying to write their names on the board. Other people would just kind of like hover near a chair and be ready to jump in it. And so there was a lot of, the, the attendant was told, you, you don't facilitate any line or queue. That's up to the, 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 the visitors in the room. That's not up to you. So they wouldn't help. And that often put people in conflict. Then people in the chairs often quickly realize, wait a second, I can auction off my chair. So then some people thought they were waiting in line. Meanwhile, people in the chairs started saying, I'm, I'm going to, um, OK, who, who wants my chair? Five tickets for my chair, six tickets for my chair. So they created their own auction uh, within this room of their individual chairs so that then someone was waiting to auction to be able to sit down and earn a penny a minute. Uh, in this space. And there are other things that happened too in this room, which was uh, one night in Boston, somebody sat uh, on, on their partner's lap and said, okay, there's two of us on this chair, you have to give us two pennies. And the attendant looked at their job description, it didn't say what they should do, so they said, okay, here's two pennies. And so um, very quickly um, that night, within, within like 20 minutes, there were like seven or eight people deep, strangers, <laughs> sitting on each other's laps. And every night we had a talk back uh, with the audience for about half an hour after the, after the show. And so someone said, okay, I have to ask you, we solved that room, right? Like we figured that room out, like we, we got that room. And Natalie, my, my collaborator said, um, we never saw that happen before. You know, so, so, so every night there was this wonderful, interesting creative behavior. I'll give you a couple more quick examples. Um, uh, there's really no single way or goal to win, but it's supported many player invented goals. So these, are, these are shots from the, the ribbon room, which was um, a place that was difficult to enter. You had to, um, you had to, you had to get, buy a pass from the, there was, there's a kind of a money exchange place. You can buy a pass. Of course, a person working there doesn't know what a pass does, so they can't tell you. But if you buy it, it says, you know, find a special attendant. Some of the attendants have a label that says special attendant, and they'll take you to this room. So it's a sort of a, a multi-step process. Um, and um, once you arrive and get in, you realize that the, um, the exit fee is extremely expensive, like 20 pennies or 20 tickets or something. And so this, this participant, like many of them, just couldn't afford to leave. Um, <laughs> but she also refused to be picked up by the guards. Uh, and then the, the attendant kind of leaves them there. <laughs> so so uh, there are a lot of interesting things that happened in this room, too. There were, there were a couple people, there was a group of people that were in. And they, if they realized if they all pooled their, their tickets together, they could pay for one person to leave. And so they started negotiating with the guards saying, um, could we, OK, so basically, a person on two legs can leave, right, with this admission fee. And the, and the attendant was like, yes, that's true. And they said, OK, so it's two legs for, for 20 tickets. Is that right? So four of them, like an acrobatics troupe, got on, somebody got on their back, and two people got on their shoulders, and they staggered out like this. And it was, you know, of course, what's the attendant going to say? That was such a lovely example of, of creative player behavior. Um, OK, one final example, just because I love this project so much. Um, there, there was a, one of the rooms was a room where you were encouraged to steal things, because the, the attendant was very friendly and would give you pennies, but then they would occasionally leave. Um, and they had to leave in Boston. The, there were these animal cages outside, so they were checking on them. But really, we also called this a storage room because we were keeping all of the, the supplies for the project there, including tickets and pennies. And, and, and we were like, what else can we store here? I know, let's put the rolls of blue tape. So people stole a roll of blue tape. Uh, most people did not steal, which was nice. But people did, were tempted and, and did steal things. And so later that night, I saw a group of people, and I knew that they were standing in an area of floor where we had not taped. And I said, and I play, in a, I play as sort of a guard-like figure there, an administrator, and so I said, you know, um, visitors, you need to stay on the blue lines. And they said, oh, but we are on a blue line. And I looked down, and they had connected two other paths with the blue tape that they had stolen. And I said, so you are, please continue. And they were so happy, like they really had. And again, that only happened one time out of all the performances that we've done, that particular that act of creativity. 
So what's interesting to me is that um, uh, waiting rooms uh, became this sort of space of possibility. And in a sense, it, it really inspired this creative behavior because it was personal. I also think it's interesting for me as a game designer because this is a game that's not a classical game. Most of the other installations that we had done, if you misunderstand a rule or cheat, it sort of breaks down. But in this, it only got better. If you're bending the rules or misunderstanding the rules or actively cheating, it only got better, in part because it was a distributed social system with a lot of flexibility. Um, and um, it, it's an interesting lesson to me about how these systems through play can, can create meaning and innovation. Um, now, in talking about um, uh, uh, games and play and their potential for, for questioning systems and playing with systems and undermining systems and the impact outside of games, I just want to take a quick aside to say I'm a skeptic when it comes to this idea that games are good for you, that, games, that, the, that the value of games is that they have a sort of a positive social um, result. And we need to be careful about instrumentalizing games, um, that, that deciding that their value is measured and how they can inject information into people as a public service message or advertising or propaganda or, or, or through education. And I'm saying this as someone who also actively investigates these areas as well. Um, I'm also skeptical about how games might change human behavior through what's called gamification. Um, and, and briefly, uh, every form of design assumes a model of what it means to be human. Uh, that's implicit in the design. And for me, the gamified model of what it means to be human is this kind of behaviorist um, uh, rap model. Um, but um, games are culture. And I'm not saying that games shouldn't or couldn't engage with ideas and themes and issues and society outside of games, that that would be silly. Um, there is rich a cultural form as art, film, or music in terms of how they interact with society. So I want to show a, a, a project that, that plays with culture maybe in a way that, that, that isn't like in the sorts of instrumentalization or, or gamification that I mentioned. The metagame is a project that I did with Colleen Macklin and, and John Sharp. Um, we self-published it. It's a card game. It's retailed in places like Target and Barnes and & Noble. Um, and it has two kinds of cards, culture cards and discussion cards, and you make comparisons. This game was the, the prototype of this was one of the inspirations for Cards Against Humanity. But it's a little bit different in that there's, um, uh, uh, there's not one way to play. There's a whole bunch of different ways to play. And some of, them, uh, some of them are more about talking and discussing. One of them is more about putting things in a timeline. Um, but it's a social party game. It's a fun social party game. And you end up making comparisons. Um, like this one, which should be required in schools, or evidence that our society is all screwed up, which will outlive us all. Um, and, and, and the idea is that it, it, um, it's a way of playing with culture. Um, and I want to show one more example of that. Now, Lost Words is a game that plays with culture in a different way. This is a sneak peek. This is an unpublished game. This is actually the first time I'm showing, showing Lost Words in public. but. Um, it's a game that uses public domain literature as a basis for a series of word games. Um, and so if, if play is about playing with structures, I think the metagame, and especially Lost Words, plays with existing structures. So I'm going to show you the vi a video that's sort of like a, a demo video, but the game is not released yet. So actually, a lot it's, and you're not going to notice, but there's a lot of prototype-y type stuff that the game is currently much better than this. So I just have to. Bear with it. This is an iPhone game. I guess that was their uh, 2019 now. Sorry. <laughs>
sorry, just uh, so so um, what I like about lost words in this context of thinking about um, uh, play in the ludic century is this idea of taking systems and and playing with them and transforming them. And I think what's what's especially interesting about uh, this relationship to the sort of culture outside of games is that um, if there's certain forms of play, like with a skateboard, where uh, when you when you play with a skateboard, it's really it's a it's a way of traversing an urban environment. So a skateboard transforms a railing or a staircase into something that is a context for play. And so seen that way, a skateboard becomes like a lens into an urban environment that changes it. It changes what you can do there and how you should behave and how you can play there. And Lost Words, in a sense, is uh, like a skateboard for literature in that we're 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 curating these public domain books. And you know you are kind of skating through them. They're the context then for for a play that happens. I wish it could be as open ended as a skateboard. That's very exciting. Maybe that'll be the the sequel. But but for now, um, uh, very happy with how Lost Words came out, and it's premiering to the public uh, in a few weeks at the Indicate Festival in Los Angeles, and it, it should be coming out next year. Um, but let's move on. Um, uh, we're on the last uh, the last idea of this ludic century design. Um, and design is really important as a supplement to, to systems and play in terms of my thinking as a game designer about this ludic century idea and literacy um, because our world is designed. Uh, if you think about it uh, at the moment, just about everything that you're experiencing is designed. Um, the light that's falling on us, the, the, the building that we're in that's kind of keeping out the elements, the insects and the wildlife, I guess, and the weather. The, the, the chairs and furniture that you're sitting in, the food that you're digesting. Um, so many aspects of our lives are designed. And as designers, we are creating the world, right? We're not just, we're not just um, uh, playing with, we're not just understanding systems and playing with them, but also actively creating them. Um, and um, the creation of a game as a system is what I call the creation of second order design. Um, in a game, we create the rules, but we don't create the, the resulting experiences or the, the impact on people on their lives and culture. Um, and it's true in some ways for all forms of design. The, the person that designed this room or, or probably company that designed this room uh, did not anticipate that on this night there'd be a lecture or someone talking about games, but they created this space of possibility that we're now inhabiting uh, in, our, in our unique way. Um, and games encourage and require this kind of active participation, again, almost like a little laboratory for this kind of literacy um, by their audiences in a way that heightens the ways that, that players participate in how they generate meaning um, through design that becomes played. Um, so uh, design blurs boundaries between players and designers. We saw that a little bit in Bernie de Coven's work. And again, it, it happens in all culture, but in games, I think, encourage this blurring in, in particular ways. In video games, we see it in things like user-generated content, hacking and modding, tournament cultures, level design communities, streaming. Um, and um, I want to share uh, a couple of final projects along this idea of, of design. So this idea that, that part of being literate today, again, is that um, we are, we're able to think about how to solve problems, um, not just by analyzing and playing with, but also by design. Um, Design for me is a way of seeing and being. It's a way of being in the world. Um, and that games can be part of helping to explore this idea. This is another sneak preview at an unpublished project called Level. Um, it grew out of work with two designers, Tony Pizza and Natalie Pozzi, again, my previous collaborator. We were working with the Child Protective Services in New York City um, to make a game for kids and parents that were going through sort of like the foster care system where parents had been separated from their children um, when they're reunited with their families, they're often at these extremely underfunded centers, and there's really nothing for them to do. And the, 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 the city wanted there to be kind of a playful activity. And since then, this project has grown into something bigger. Um, level is a deck of cards and a book. So this is the front and back of the cards. On one side of the card, there's a letter. On the other side, there's an image. We're working with an illustrator named Frank Viva and his studio. And it seems very simple when you look at it this way, but, but really, we found that this simple, basically, operating system for a game, it's like a game OS, this deck of cards can be used to play a whole variety of games. Some have been really good for, for younger kids, but, but there, you can play any kind of Boggle-like or Scrabble-like game. 
There's interesting games that resemble board games like Dixit or Code Words that you can play that mix images and, um, and, and letters. Um, and it's, it's incredibly flexible. Um, the project level is a book that comes along with this deck of cards. Um, the book shows you how to play games, but you also learn to analyze them and modify and design them. Um, and our, our idea is that this project, this product, will work as a game, but also include a, a lot of the ideas about game design that I've talked about today. So, so a lot of these things about rules and play, about how thinking about design, it's, it's kind of like my textbook with Katie Salem, Rules of Play, which was for college students. This project is like a rules of play for kids. Um, to teach them about game design through playing, analyzing, modifying, and then designing their own games. Um, it's designed for kids 8 to 12, but I would probably will use this in my college classroom, hopefully. It's, uh, I think that it, it, there's a lot of depth to this simple tool. This is a shot of the current prototypes. So you can get a sense of the process right now where we are. I was recently playtesting this game at a board game con. Um, in Europe, and there were lots of different kinds of players. There were families with kids of different ages. Um, there were some game designers. There were ner very nerdy board game connoisseurs uh, that had come there to play these, you know, German strategy games. Um, but it went over really well with, with a wide variety of the audience. And as we were playing the games, we're, we're really play testing them, right? We're, we're seeing that, that they don't all work very well. And as that happens, I talk with them about what can we do to make it better, right? What can we do to fix them? And then right there, we try out those ideas and, and talk about how to make the games better. We're improvising and designing, pushing and pulling at the rules of the system, changing the rules on the fly, improvising, in order to make a more beautiful shape of play for that moment. Um, and my own sense of myself in those moments as a designer expands. And my sense of authorship then comes to include my audience. And so this is part of why I feel design is so important as part of this idea of the ludic century. That design is intrinsically a kind of humanizing uh, discipline where you recognize the other, you collaborate with your audience, and you understand that you have to design for someone else and see the world through their eyes, in a sense. Um, and so Level also very much grows out of these ideas of literacy, of systems, play, and especially design. Um, so what's at stake? In, in seeing the world as designed, not taking the built environment or the media landscape or our social and political structures for granted, but understanding them as part of the designed world. What's at stake? Well, a lot is at stake. Um, sometimes design can also be social design, just getting the same people in the room. And I have a final example for, for tonight, then we can wrap up and maybe have a few questions. Um, so um, over the last year, as part of an initiative called Gaming the System, I worked with um, the journalism and design program at the New School in New York City, New School University, um, and these news organizations, ProPublica and the New York Times. And the idea was, with these ideas of the ludic century and systems and play and design, what can we do? What can we create together sort of over these disciplines? I, so we brought together journalists and information designers and game people together to talk about these issues. And we had no idea what would come out of it. Um, but hopefully I was thinking something that uh, wasn't a game about a topic, but somehow used these ideas of systems thinking and literacy and play and design. Um, so we, we, uh, we had journalists presenting research. We brainstormed topics and talked about different design models. People were in groups coming up with ideas, small ideas, rapid fire. Uh, and then we chose a smaller number of those ideas to expand and move forward with. And then those got brainstormed and expanded. Um, and so, so, so what came out of this? This all happened last spring. Um, honestly, nothing. Nothing came out of this. Nothing that, that we liked, that the people organized it liked, because it's, it's a very difficult problem. And we didn't really escape from these traps that I talked about um, when we often look at the intersection of games and real world impact. Um, so, which has been frustrating, considering I feel very guilty about this. I got a lot of very smart people to spend a lot of time uh, coming together for these meetings. Um, to, to think about this issue, but failure is part of the design process too. And I wanted to share something. Usually when you have these talks, people present all this stuff that works and looks so beautiful in the end and seems so great. But this is a project I'm working on, and I really want to do this. I really want to think about government systems as systems that are broken and they're being gamed, and how can we redesign them or think about them. But I don't know what that would mean. I don't want it to be a serious game where you just simulate one of these systems. But we haven't figured that out, but ho hopefully we'll get there because there is a lot at stake. Um, it's not a left or right debate. 
Um, it's about fairness and the creativity to find new solutions, engaging with culture, being playful with the systems that shape us, even as we play them and redesign them. Games are part of the problem, like I said, but I think that they can hopefully be part of the solution too in our coming ludic century. Um, let me just end with one anecdote. Um, several years ago, I met with Andrew Hiskins, who leads what is called the Learning Services at the State Library of Victoria in Australia. He's doing really interesting and innovative work, and he told me that in a recent workshop, um, they flipped the script of the usual student-teacher relationship, and it was about how students could become teachers and teach the teachers. So he met with children, was trying to get them to understand how they could better teach the teachers about technology, about games, about their lives and their needs. And at first the students had trouble wrapping their heads around this inversion of the usual kind of social classroom dynamic. But they soon took to it, giving recommendations and strategies, and they really got, got into it. And as Andrew put it, one of the students told him, OK, we understand you now. We think it could be possible to teach the teachers. But first, they really have to want to learn. <laughs> thank you very much for playing together today. Uh, thank you for uh, your time. And I know this was billed as an hour. I was told I could go a little bit over. Oh, yeah. Do we want to have a little bit of Q&A? Yes, please. So OK. If you have questions, comments? Yeah. Um, well, let me just stand up. Plan of signing it in, but I, as a game designer, yes. one question I have is the idea, one of the things that are kind of controversial right now is like the concept of loot boxes. Okay. Or the idea of the player choice ideology. Right. Do you think, noticing one thing apparent is, since the creators of, like, for example, they'll say, like, certain characters don't want to take that long, take that path of game this item. Right. Do you think that's more on the de the designer because, in a way, the designer kind of structured the game to be like that, mm -hmm. or do you think it's more of the intent of the player that should be a used to de deal with the the choices? Yes, it's a really interesting question. Now, so, so for those of you that don't know, this idea of loot box it's a particular revenue model that has to do with um, finding sort of random treasures, paying for them. In in modern games, what we've seen is there's often a, a balance of, um, of labor and, uh, and capital. Sorry, uh, yeah, labor and capital. So that, for example, in a massive multiplayer online game, you can spend time leveling up your character. It might be hours and days or weeks or months. Or you can convert that time into money and just buy a high level character, whether legally or illegally, depending on the game. And so you're sort of converting time to, to capital that way. Um, again, very much like waiting rooms, now that you think about it. So, um, but what's interesting is that the games, it's, your question really goes very deep because it's really about the relation between play and work or between games and, and, and kind of capital systems. And, and traditionally, and I, and I say this just in the sense of some very traditional scholars, and I think it's an interesting point of view, games are separate from ordinary life. And so that some scholars have written that there's this kind of, that what's interesting about a game is that, like I said, this pointing only had meaning within this game, right? On the other hand, and so they would say, well, games are kind of separate from capital. The games have always had a kind of problematic relationship or an interesting, complicated relationship to, to money. Um, and so part of this has been the revenue model for games. So it was very simple when a game was a product that was manufactured on a shelf. Um, the video games, when I started in the industry, what was made in a factory and you bought it like a book or, or a can of soup um, you, and you paid for it at a cash register and it didn't feel that special. But now that so many games are digitally distributed, people are inventing these, all these interesting kinds of flexible models. What's interesting to me is that these ethical considerations come into it. So there was, before the loot box controversy, there was an earlier controversy about revenue models that had to do with what was called free to play, a game that you could play, pay for free, but then later on it would ask you to, for money or require you to have money. So what's interesting is that that became controversial and seen as a kind of a negative sort of game to have. But in an earlier generation of video games, there was what was called shareware um, before there were online digital networks. And that, that might be you actually like bought a floppy disk or, or got a free demo. And then to unlock it, you had to write the creator and they would send you a code and you would type it in. And so that, was, that shareware was, uh, was also free to play, so to speak. 
But that was seen as a much more kind of radical, revolutionary uh, yeah, uh, way to go. So I am getting to your question, believe it or not. So I, I don't have a single answer for you. Where does the, where does the blame lie? But what interests me is that these issues of, of play and, um, and capital introduce ethics. And so people feel it's ethical or unethical to structure a game a certain way, definitely to trick players or to seduce someone into a game, but without them understanding exactly what, what, um, um, what, what, uh, you know, what the ramifications are. Loot boxes, probably the best precedent for them is Magic the Gathering, the collectible card game, when you would buy a little pack of cards and not know what was in it. So you were spending money without knowing exactly what you were getting. That was revolutionary at the time and interesting, and, but then, then that also became to seen as exploitative. So I don't have an answer for you, but I think it's, it's a really fascinating set of, set of questions. Um, yes? driving and heard a like public service announcement on the radio today that when you play with dogs with a laser pointer, it will create aggression and anxiety for them because it, it, there's no real payoff. Mm. And they become like mentally fixated on finding like the little red dot again. Mm. Whereas cats, it's not so much of a problem because they have shorter attention spans and they don't mentally, or as far as they <laughs> they don't mentally That is a fascinating. <laughs> but so like from a, I don't know, I, I tried to actually quit games for the first time when I was, I don't know, maybe 14 years old and like I had spent like a full like three days straight doing nothing but like taking naps and playing <laughs> The Sims and I felt, found that pretty destructive for myself. <laughs> Is it like an evolutionary psychology perspective of like, you know, when it like when are people getting addicted to like trying to gain a thing that's not real, like any real um right. you know, payoff and like how do you I don't know, how do you do you see that there's some solutions in place for that and like Yeah, it's an interesting world? question. I mean addiction often comes up when we talk about games. Games are not chemically addictive the way uh, e-cigarettes are, even on the way over here from the parking garage, there was a car parked and then right next to the, to the, to the door, clear, there was just a, several packages of e-cigarettes e just ripped open. Clearly someone had just arrived and just ripped them open and like <laughs> needed their... So games to me are more like other forms of addiction that are behavioral but not chemical, like people get addicted to reading or exercise or um, other things that can become a negative or behavior. And it's tricky because um, games um, in some ways are designed to play with your desire, right? And so they're, they're an activity, they're a, they're a form of leisure or art or entertainment that can become a repetitive activity. Um, and so I, I, on the other hand, I would say that when play loses its voluntary quality, then it's not play in the sort of the joyful sense and the creative sense and that kind of thing. But it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a tricky, um, uh, it's a tricky balance. I think that that as a designer, you want to, and it, it actually relates to the loot box. It's about designers being aware of the kind of ethical implications of what they're doing. So, and games can take so many forms, right? I mean, waiting rooms is not something you could get addicted to. It's more like a performance event that you attend. But lost words, you know, we're we're skating that line. It, you know, you. You, we, want, we want our players to be engaged and we want them to, to keep on playing, but we don't have a revenue model that, that rewards us if they get addicted, which I think is, is what you want to be careful about. So, um, you know, the, the argument could be made that, that, that it's almost the risk of addiction that's part of the thrill of games, that it kind of puts you face to face with your own sense of desire and pleasure and you sort of have to negotiate that. It's like some, you know, some of you might have to negotiate that with like a big slice of chocolate cake, right? You know that it may not be good for you, but, but you want it and then do you find a compromise or do you, when do you succumb to it? So, and I think that can be interesting as this kind of psychological experience. So to me what's, what's fascinating about games is that like food, they can play on, or maybe pornography or other forms of culture, they can play on um, those almost biological levels. On the other hand, they also have a lot in common with literature and, and art and film. They can be cultural, they can be documentary, they can, you know, so, so there, it's a very, very complicated cultural form that way because we're designing a media that's also an activity. The activity is embedded in it, in a sense. Does that, I, I don't know if I really answered your question, yeah, but. Yeah, like if it's something that, you know, in your, like in your discipline, people are really trying to solve this as a problem. 
yeah, well, you know, some people are trying to, if you look at the traditional iPhone game publisher, they're desperately trying to get more players, get them to stay, and get them to spend money. And it's just like if you're designing a, a, a shoe store. You're trying to get more people in the store, get them to stay, and get them to spend money. So it's this, it is a kind of, I think, a part of the capitalist drive of, of that. But, but, but the, other, the one thing I hadn't mentioned is what you said I thought was fascinating about, does it have to do with the, the unreality of it? And I don't know. I mean, it's an interesting question. I mean, I, I, I think that the meaning in games is, I, I, I don't know. I thought, well, maybe like money also doesn't really have intrinsic meaning, but it is usually guaranteed by the state. So maybe it's not, not a good example. But. Well, like one gaming habit that I have that like totally fits with my personality and my needs and my desires is playing on Duolingo, um, where I uh -huh. learn a language and then I get tired of it when I've learned too much and I need to uh -huh. just get away from the learning. Because it, it's, right. it's fun and it does kind of hit those pleasure centers, but I'm getting a real thing of value. Like they told they said in the announcement about the dogs and laser, laser pointers, if you need to, you know, you should get them adjusted to tennis balls because there's a tangible thing mm -hmm. that they can get. And then to wean them off the laser pointer, maybe put like a treat that you direct them to with the laser pointer so they have some kind of real right, payoff. It's about having, like when I learn a language, I have a real psychological payoff. Right. You know? So uh, yeah, I, I think what's, yeah, I think what's, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting set of, uh, this is a kind of a process of self-regulation that we do. So yeah, it's a very, very interesting question. I guess I really, oh, sorry, you can go. I just really quick have, a, uh, I guess, an ethics-related question too. Can you say a little bit more about what um, is going to possibly be problematic about using gamification as a learning tool? That sure. seems like it's very hot right now. It is. Um, and I've, I've noticed, um, some things that could be problematic. I'd like to hear you. I'm happy to talk about that. And I should say that there's a lot of people doing interesting work in, in games and learning. And I always recommend James Paul G, G E E. Um, he wrote a book called What Games Have to Teach Us About Learning and Literacy. And he doesn't look at educational games, he looks at commercial games. Um, that's a great resource. The Institute of Play, they were the nonprofit that I helped start, they really look at the whole situation. They do teacher training, they do school design and curriculum design, and it's not just about somehow the game are being the arbiter. But I'll give you one example. I, I'm not a psychologist, I'm um, a game designer, though I guess every game designer is a little bit of a psychologist. But, but there's, a, there's a book called Punished by Rewards, which is about um, the, the, the danger of extrinsic rewards. In other words, if you clean your room, you get a reward. And that's the sort of the gamification of child rearing in this case, or, or education, is that the danger is that then the association is made between the reward and the action. And rather than the intrinsic value of having a clean room or being organized, instead, the, the person gets more dependent on the extrinsic reward, and they're less likely to keep the room clean if the reward isn't given. So there's lots of weird things like that that, that can happen um, that sort of do the exact opposite of what you want. And that gamification really emerges, the best examples of gamification, the early ones were like frequent flyer programs, where they have points and levels and rewards. And for me, there's, gamification often is strip mining the surface of games, but leaving behind the sort of the soul of play, right? The sort of innovation and creativity, um, because it's sort of, it's just, it's doing, it's, it's interested in the engagement, right? Oh, if only, you know, we could have them as engaged on our you know, website as they are with their commercial games. So how do we do that? We give them rewards and badges and things like that. So um, that's, uh, those are some of the things I find problematic. And I'll just say finally that you know, I always want to push up against the idea that the value of games is in this behavior change. The value of, for me, games are like, it's like music. It's just a human activity and it's okay to say it, it's just beautiful. And we, we like sports or, or video games or board games because they're beautiful to watch or to participate in. And I think that's OK. Um, I would never want to say that games have to you know, cause behavioral change and be valuable. But that's, that's a, a whole different way that I push against them. But I, I really think that um, you know, there's, whether it's the punish by rewards or the silver bullet idea that you know, it's the game alone that, that does the change, we would, we would um, I, OK, I'll give you one final example. My, my parents' field was art education. They were professors of art ed uh, at Indiana University, where I grew up. And so and usually gamification is about this in behavior change or injecting information or get, getting measurable change in the 
in the, um, in the student, right? And so, the, and I understand the, the drive to be measurable. This is part of the games of the problem. Part of the ludic century is this almost autistic sense of, of like the no child left behind, the constant standardized testing that is dragging education back to the 19th century, basically, because the, the skills that, it's, that, can, that can be measured quantitatively are, are not the highest level thinking skills. Um, um, so again, according to my colleagues that are in literacy, uh, and education. So art, art education to me is an interesting example of a discipline that's about education related to an aesthetic form, art. But art educators aren't about measuring quantitatively the information transfer, the behavior change that you get by looking at a painting. It just doesn't make sense when you say it out loud, right? But with games, we kind of put on them all of this, just the object itself, just the system, just the text itself, all of this weight of the game has to do all of this work. In a museum, the work, first of all, it's not this kind of quantitative behavior change, but it's done in a context with an educator and a social group through discussion and, and preparation for the museum visit or what you do while you're there, the activities that you're doing. So it's, it's, a, it's a whole, maybe you're, they're also creating art. So it, it's a whole set of series of activities. Um, and so part of the problem with gamification is that it's sort of like the game itself is the match? It's sort of magical thinking about the way education works. So anyway, I've given you a scatter shot of several different problems that I have with it. But I I do think that play as a model for learning is really exciting and interesting. So I wouldn't want to 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 sweep you know sweep all of that away. I think you you had your hand up yes. earlier. Uh, earlier you mentioned something about the idea that games are basically uh, actions within descriptions. Mm -hmm. uh, so that led me to a question that. Would you say that uh, the point of the game is to reach an end goal despite the restrictions, and thus those restrictions are what makes a game fun? Um, I think that is an excellent model for thinking about a game. There's no, anytime anyone asks to define a game, just be skeptical because it's always, if, if that, I'm a designer, so for me, truth is utility. If a definition works to solve a problem, it's true. It may not be true in another context, but I think that's an excellent way to frame what a game is. We think about bowling, for example. Um, Bernard Suits has a book called um, Grasshopper, Games Life Utopia, and he talks about games are the, games are the addition of unnecessary obstacles. This sort of weird paradox. Oh, we take on, so if, 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 if my real goal in bowling was to knock over the pins, what am I doing standing over here with this heavy ball? Just hold on a second. Ready? Strike, right? So, so, but instead, when we bowl, we all agree we're going to follow these rules. I'm going to stand way over here, this heavy thing. I'm not very good at bowling and, 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 and bowl. So um, I just got a gutter ball, by the way. So um, uh, this, part of the, this part of the mind class, I think. Uh, so, um, uh, so, so yes, that is a, that's a in, really interesting way of thinking about games. That, that I think, what, what did you say? You said that, the, that there's a goal and then Restrictions are right. what cause uh, fun. Right. And the, the, the restrictions are that weird sort of, there's pleasure. Mm -hmm. It's almost like pleasure is the heat that comes out of those restrictions rubbing up against human activity. You know, that somehow pleasure emerges out of that. And that's sort of the fun or the interest of a game. It can be individual. It can be social pleasure. It can be narrative pleasure, identification with the character in a game. There's all kinds of, of pleasure ways of framing games. But of course, that's a very classical idea of what a game is. So you can, you can play with that as a game designer. You can, like in waiting rooms, just to give a simple example, we take the goal away from you so you don't know why you're there. And that gives you more of a feeling of being lost and helpless, even though you might find momentary pleasure in these sort of, you know, stealing the tape and making tape lines, or, you know, sitting in a chair, or figuring out the system. It's a different kind of pleasure. So, or, or in a game like Undertale, uh, where you think the ending is one thing, and then you realize, oh, it's really flipped on its head, all, but then there's pleasure in that too. So, um, but yeah, games, goals are usually, Frank Lance, who teaches at the Game Center, he's the head of the Game Center, he often sometimes says that goals are like gravity. Mm -hmm. They help you understand, they sort of put, they align everything, all the parts of a game. It's sort of, you know which way is up. You know if this is a good move or a bad move in chess because there's a goal. Am I advancing towards that goal or not? On the other hand, um, yeah, any, yeah, it's like music. Any rule of good music, we could say, in punk rock violates all of them, right? Punk rock is still music because it's culture. So any rules of painting that cubism violated and that got violated by minimalism and right. So so that's why I'm hesitant to say that yes, that's what games are because they're a cultural form. 
So we can try and understand them in these formal ways, but there's always going to be wonderful examples that challenge our expectations. But you know, I like to teach my students good design so that they can question it and bend it and break it and you know, make, make things that are completely the opposite. Um, I don't know how much time we have. We have time for like one more question. One, one more, yes. <laughs> Oh, here we go. <laughs> I'm ready. Talk be named living in the loose century. How would you define the word ludic? And then second of all, with being in the gaming industry for over 25 years, what do you see for the gaming industry in the next 10 years? Mm, those are good questions. So ludic comes from the Latin word ludus. And all I really mean is it is a way of framing thinking of the century through the lens of play. So can we think of the 21st century as being defined through games and play, of this systems play and design, these ideas that I presented today. So again, just coming out of the idea of um, what, what characterizes our time today, uh, the, the age in which we're living, the times in which we're living, in, at least in industrialized you know, uh, countries, and what, what can I as a game designer offer in terms of a point of view that might be helpful for people. So again, there's not the only way to look at them, and it's very, kind of myopic and self-centered, but um, uh, does that answer the first part of the question? So the second one was what's happening in the game industry the next 25 years? Wow, that's, I, I, um, that's a hard question. I, I do see economically that um, I think television in the early 2000s actually went down for the first time. The average number of, of hours of television per week um, went down. Um, since um, um, uh, since the invention of the television. So games are still very much on the rise. And that's also part of this ludic century idea that publishing and, and the, the record industry, the book industry, the moving image, I guess, is still there through streaming, but they're trying to figure it out. But games are just booming economically. People are spending their time there and they're spending their money there. And I think that, um, uh, you know, I feel that when I'm educating my students to be game designers, I'm also just equipping them with design skills or media skills to work in advertising or, or in publishing or content or with technology uh, or in architecture or, or in other ways that, you know. And I, I think that games are going to become, I mean, for me, games are like a, a way of thinking about the world. Um, and, y you know, it's very hard to say it's possible that we could see games sort of fading out and something replaces them, uh, or that they become so pervasive that um, you know, they're sort of everywhere. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's, it, it's, it's hard to say. But I'll, I'll, end, I'll end with this one anecdote, which is that um, I was at a, at, a, at a talk at Games for Change, and Danny Hillis Miller, who I think invented serial processing, is that, is that who I'm thinking of, um, gave this. He was talking about games and, and learning, and he said, you know, um, he looks at kids, and this was when Rock Band just came out with the classic guitars, and he said, okay, well, um, you know, I, I feel like um, um, uh, I'm seeing these kids, and they don't realize they're not really making music, but at least some of them are ending up um, uh, learning rock and roll guitar, and thank God for that, you know? And so that seems to make sense, and you're like, yeah, you're right, at least some of them are getting real music lessons. But if you think about it, 50 years ago, Rock and roll guitar was not commonly accepted as a positive human thing to do. It was seen as like demonic or sexualized, <laughs> uh, underground. It was gonna, you know, like ruin teenagers' lives, and people were burning rock and roll records. So, so what's interesting about that comment is just how these cultural forms change over time. And I think about maybe a future time when they, when there's something that's sort of replaced games, and um, and I don't know what it is if some kind of mutilation culture or some strange, I don't know, something that's so like weird and you know, we can say, well, they're, they're doing this thing and oh my gosh, they don't realize how bad it is for them and they're, 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 you know, they're hurting themselves, but at least some of them are end up playing games. <laughs> so that, that's where we might end up in the future, that, that games become this kind of commonly accepted uh, human value that we don't, that we don't question um, and that we put alongside music and image making and storytelling as a, as a basic and positive human activity. And in a sense, it's already there because it's so ancient, but also in another sense, it's, um, 
uh, you know, it's something that I am an advocate for and try and convince people about the sophistication and importance of games. And that's really what the Ludic Century is about, too. Thank you again very much. Please join come join. Have a snack and mingle with uh, Professor Zimmerman some more, please. Thank you. Non-doctor, yes.